Hello, I'm Ray Graves, and I'm pleased to be able to present to you the members of our fine athletic cat and to show you some scenes from our outstanding all-sports program here at the University of Florida. The University, home of the Fighting Gators, is located in beautiful Gainesville in North Central Florida, and here we believe we have one of the finest physical plants for athletics in America. Before we look at our teams in action, I'd like for you to meet some of the staff members whose duties are involved with all sports. This is Percy Beard, the Assistant Director of Athletics, who is also our track coach. Meet Holm Hoosier, Administrative Assistant to the Athletic Director. And now, Jimmy Gay, Head of our Sports Publicity Department. Colonel Everett Young, Director of Public Relations and Head of Gator Boosters. The all-round program in sports at the University of Florida is, we are proud to say, as outstanding as any in the nation. Why don't you come with me and let's take a look around. Let's go first to the Florida pool. Over the years, the University of Florida has dominated the Southeastern Conference women. And we see the Gators in action here against a traditional opponent. Coach Buddy Crone and assistant coach Bill Harlan devote many hours to the development of Florida's outstanding divers and swimmers. They're talking here with Captain Roy Tanahisi, a real champion himself. Let's go now to the University of Florida track and one of the biggest track and field events of the early season. The fourth. These fine athletes put on a great show for enthusiastic track fans. One of the most respected men in the track coaching profession is Percy Beard. Seen here in a discussion with co-captains Tommy Michelle and Art Foster, and with assistant coach Walter Welch, who is also head coach of cross country. Just west of the track, the tennis team in action. The Gators are growing stronger each year in this sport, and in 1960, Coach Bill Potter feels he has a champion in the making. Coach Potter is seen talking to co-captain Dale Moser and Roy Lang. Jim Schaefer is a fine player who is developing into a great star. I was very pleased this year to have Norman Sloan join our staff as head coach of basketball. As in all sports, the university is planning to attain national recognition for its basketball team. And I feel that Coach Sloan is the man to help us do this job. Norman, I believe the folks would like to hear something about your plan. Thank you, Coach. First, I would like to say how pleased I am to be a part of the university's excellent athletic program and that I am looking forward to participating in the Southeastern Conference, one of the finest conferences in the country, if not the best. It is our ambition to build a program that will be a consistent challenger for the Southeastern Conference Championship. In addition to this, we will play the type of non-conference schedule that will assure our team or any member of the team national recognition should it be deserved. Why don't we go over to the Florida gym now and see some members of the University of Florida basketball team working on a few of our favorite drills. After the warm-up routine and individual shooting practice, we go to our one-on-one -on -one drills. One-on-one -on -one defensive and offensive fundamentals we believe to be the starting point of basketball. We work one-on-one -on -one every day in practice emphasizing change of direction moves and shooting the jump shot off a fake drive step. We are working just as hard on defense in all of these drills as we are offense. After one-on-one, -on -one, we move to two-on-two -two drills. 
we have seven fundamental moves in our two-man plays. Number one is the give-and-go move used against a pressing defense. Number two is pass and screen for the man you pass to using all of the options off of a normal screen situation. Number three and four work off the screen moves. In one, we bluff a screen and break to the basket getting a lead pass. In the other, we bluff a screen and V to the corner, setting up the one-on-one -on -one for our forward and setting up the give-and-go for the forward or the pass and screen situation. Number five is the dip, which is just another way of setting up the screen situation. Number six is our reverse play, whereby one player dribbles hard at his teammate with the defense pressing or overplaying, and just as the dribbler approaches his potential receiver, he bounce passes to him as he reverses his defensive man. This, I think, is the prettiest play in basketball. In number seven, the ball is taken to a teammate on a hard dribble and the receiver takes the ball from the dribbler and drives off him using him as a screen. All of our practice situations are designed to produce the style of basketball the players enjoy participating in and the spectators enjoy watching. And now let's go out to the Gainesville Golf and Country Club, the scene of many fighting Gator victors. Championship golf has become traditional at the University of Florida. The Gators regular are in the thick of things in the race for the Southeastern Conference and Southern Intercollegiate titles. Shooting up for events ahead are players Skip Seeger, the Gator co-captain, and star Frank Beard, a man who really makes a mockery of pop. Conrad Railing looks over the scorecards of Steger and Beard at the end of the round, and he seems pleased with the results. Now at Perry Field, the Gators get ready for action in baseball. Coach Dave Fuller and co-captains Perry McGriff and Don Fleming run down the starting lineup. It's long hitting like this home run by second baseman Dale Landis that makes Florida a real championship contender in the Southeastern Conference almost every year. Here are some of the scenes from Gator games during 1960, which led to Florida's participation in the NCAA championship playoff.
feel I have been fortunate in being able to assemble the finest football coaching staff in the nation. They're all top flight coaches, full of enthusiasm for the game and eager to bring the university an outstanding team. Suppose well, we go down to the practice field now and see some of these coaches in action. Pepper Rogers, sending the backs through a group of plays, joined the staff this year after serving as backfield coach of the Air Force Academy. He was a fine quarterback for Georgia Tech in his playing days, and many fans remember him as a fine placement kicker. Cheryl Scarborough is a member of the former Fighting Gators and has been a member of the Florida staff for the past several years. He also served as football coach and athletic director for Central Florida School. This is a linebacker reaction drill he's directing at the moment. People quite often marvel at Jack Green's winning All-American honors in his playing days at West Point, since he isn't the largest man around. Just as he was a great player, Jack is a highly regarded coach. He joined our staff this year after serving as assistant coach at Tulane. Here he works with some of the linemen. John Donaldson is another who became a member of the Florida football staff this season. The former Georgia Bulldog is conducting a tipping drill that helps the players keep alert on pass defense. He coached some outstanding teams while serving at Wayne County High School in Jessup, Georgia. And I feel confident he will help us to do the same thing with the fighting game. Coach John Maurer, a veteran member of the Florida staff, was a teammate of the famed Red Grange at Illinois. Here he is seen working with one of his favorite drills on defense. Coach Maurer has had an impressive career as a football coach and is considered a master of defensive play by ends and linebackers. could operate without a capable trainer. Florida is fortunate to have Sam Langford, another veteran staff member. Coach Dave Fuller stays busy in the spring with baseball, but in the fall he is head freshman football coach. He came by long enough to show us his past defense drill. A former star athlete for Wake Forest, he has been on the Florida staff since 1946. Jim Power was an All-American at the University of Tennessee, and some of his past catching records there still stand. He's given the Gators here the benefit of his experience in that department. Jim was a very successful high school coach in Miami before coming to the University of Florida a few years back. John Eibner, former All-SEC player for Kentucky, has been on the coaching staff at Miami and Florida and is considered an outstanding scout of the opponents. Here we see him directing the Beast squad in an opponent's play. Legs really fly when Gene Ellison sends his charges through this hamburger drill. Gene played football for Georgia and served as a standout high school coach at Miami, Florida, and helped guide the University of Miami to some outstanding records as that team's defensive line coach.
This spring we held a scrimmage game after only 11 days of practice. Then at the end of the spring drills we held another inter-squad game. Let's take time now to see some of the highlights of both of these games and see how they came out. The University of Florida's play-by-play -play expert, Otis Boggs, will narrate the action. After only 11 days of spring practice, the Gators tangle in the first of two inter-squad struggles. With the Blues finally overcoming the Orange team in a hard-fought game. Here's senior Doug Parton returning the opening kickoff to the 37-yard line in a nice return. Larry Libertor, the tiny 138-pound quarterback for the Orange team, which is dressed in white jerseys, shows he's slippery and determined as he gains six around left end on the option play. It's Libertor once again. This time, he rolls out to pass, is trapped, reverses his field, avoids several tacklers, and finally slips and falls. Now sophomore Lindy Infanti, orange halfback, shoots through left tackle for six yards before being down by linebacker John McBeth. The orange team, after being stopped, lines up for a field goal attempt at the 22-yard line. It's a fake, and Libertor rolls out to his right and completes a pass to Infanti down to the four-yard line. Later, the orange team was on the move again and had traveled to the Blues 27. So now senior halfback Don Deal goes off left tackle for 12 yards to the 15-yard strike. It's the elusive Libertor attempting to pass, decides to run, and gains six more big yards around right in before being stopped by senior end Nick Arthur. Sophomore fullback Ron Worthington of Miami smacks over left tackle, and it's a touchdown for the yard. The try for two extra points fails, and this later team's caught. The Blues are on the go. Sophomore quarterback Bobby Dodd Jr. pitches out on this option play to sophomore halfback Jerome Shaw of Apopka. Shaw rambles down the left sideline for 27 yards to the orange 26 before fleet in Bruce Starling hauls him down. Here, Dodd rolls out to his right and completes a pass to Shaw for four yards. A personal foul temporarily stalls the oncoming blue team. Now young Dodd combines a fine pass with some timely luck to complete this touchdown to senior end Pat Patchen, who grabs the ball on a rebound off a defender in the end zone. Sophomore end Billy Cash places the ball neatly between the uprights, and the Blues go ahead in the game 7-6, to six, and they hang on to win it by that score. In direct contrast to the first low-scoring game, the Fighting Gators closed out spring drills in high-scoring fashion. This is sophomore Tom Batten gaining 11 yards on a pass play to halfback Jim Miller. The Blues have to punt, and they call on Ronnie Stewart. Stewart gets a good kick away for 42 yards. The kick is taken in by Larry Libertor at the 20, and he circles to his left behind fine blocking by Doug Parton, Bill McClellan, Ronnie Slack. Returns good for 32 yards. The first quarter ends in a scoreless deadlock, but now the orange is on the move with Parton gaining six off left tackle. Fullback Macbeth hauls through left guard for a gain of eight and a first down. Now it's Parton again, and the Orange is really getting warmed up as Parton goes for 39 big yards right up the middle to the Blues 34-yard line. Sophomore Lindy Infanti hits off right tackle for five yards. Here's that man Libertor again, and now he keeps the ball on the bootleg play and goes for a gain of eight. Infanti takes off around right in for 21 yards, getting a good block by John Macbeth for an apparent score. However, it's called back on a penalty. Still in the first half, the Orange team's Bob Hoover, promising Jacksonville sophomore halfback, gains eight to the Blues' 18-yard line. Fullback Sonny Giles picks up an important first down, going for three yards off right tackle. And now Doug Parton gets nine yards down to the Blues' five. On second down and three, Jack Jones spots sophomore Sam Holland. The game's first touchdown is on the scoreboard. Jones makes it eight to nothing for the Orange team as he keeps for two extra points. Here we find the Orange team ahead 23 to nothing in the third quarter. And Libertor pitches out to Infanti for a gain of 12. This time it's Bob Hoover going for seven yards around left end. 
High-popping Larry Libertor decides to keep. And after being almost stopped, he goes on to the four-yard line as he picks up 35 yards on this round. Fullback John McBeth hits off right tackle for the touchdown. Billy Cash puts up another point and scores 30 to nothing for the Orange. In the final period, Tom Batten's 20-yard pass to Gene DeFury takes the ball down to the 8-yard line. This time, Batten, who completed 10 passes in the game for 117 yards, throws to Tom Kelly, resulting in the Blues' only score. Action continued hot and heavy, such as this fine run for 20 yards by John McBeth. Larry Libertor on a keeper play makes the final score and the Orange wins it 42 to 6. Well, there you have some of the reasons why we are so proud of our athletic program here at the University of Florida. I hope you'll be with us on the campus to enjoy many of these wonderful sports in the future. Uh -huh.